I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for August 7th, 2018. I invite you to stand if you choose while Commissioner Williams leads us in invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Pray with me if you choose. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings of this life. We would ask that you be with us as we consider the business that's brought before us. Give us the wisdom to consider each and every item and handle it in a way that will be pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Commissioner Williams? Here. Commissioner Denning is absent. Commissioner Nash? Here. Commissioner Perrigin? Here. Mayor Wilkerson? Here. Do you have any awards or recognitions? There is one award, though. Matt, I think it's your turn for the awards, recognitions. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. It's uh, my pleasure to be here tonight before you to talk about our recent accreditation certificate uh, that the Bowling Green Police Department uh, recently received. Uh, the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police created their accreditation program in 1992 as a means of helping police organizations evaluate and improve their overall performance. Uh, to become accredited, the Bowling Green Police Department had to comply with 171 standards uh, set by the accrediting body. The, the standards are professional objectives that range from organizational control uh, to the use of force. Some of the advantages of being accredited um, are provides a norm for the agency to judge its performance, uh, promotes accountability among agency personnel and even-handed application of the policies, provides a means of independent evaluation of agency operations as well. So the Bowling Green Police Department uh, received its first accreditation in 1993 uh, making us the second agency in the Commonwealth to do so. Every five years since then, uh, 1993, we go through a reaccreditation process. Over the past six months, uh, the PD has completed the necessary requirements to once again be accredited by the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police. So after an on-site assessment by the evalu uh, evaluators, we were sex successfully retained our accreditation status, making us the longest accredited, one of the longest accredited agencies in the Commonwealth in the last 25 years. Congratulations, and, and they, Matt. That's yeah, a lot of work. Awesome. Thank you. I know you didn't, you didn't do all of that by yourself. Who else helped you with that? Yeah, uh, a lot of help. It, it took several people. Penny Bowes, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Penny Bowes was a great help. Uh, the training staff was a great help. And I'd like to thank the chief for uh, giving me this task. Even a lot of people probably wouldn't thank him for that task, but it was a it was a, a nice uh, responsibility to see all the different levels of how our agency work and why the policies, quite frankly, are why they are sometimes. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, public's information, we're the only city in Kentucky and one of just 20 or 30 in the United States that have uh, professionally accredited police department, fire department, and public works department all at the same time. So it goes to show that we're trying to do the best we can according to the standards that are out there available. And I would like to mention our communications department at the police station is uh, accredited as well. So one of the, they sure. were one of the first ones. I so. forgot about that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I feel a little uncomfortable saying this, but uh, I don't want anybody to think that it's bring your favorite pirate to the commission meeting night. Uh, I am currently uh, dealing with a condition called Bell's palsy that has resulted in temporary paralysis of the left side of my face, which prevents me from closing my eye, which is why I have to wear the patch and why I can't say the letters P or F very well. Uh, so if you don't understand anything I say tonight, uh, please ask me to repeat it. It won't hurt my feelings. I work with kids and there isn't anything that you could possibly say that they haven't already said to me. Uh, from somebody put a cigarette out in my eye to I've been shot with a firecracker. Uh, so they read the newspaper and know where I stand on particular issues. But I appreciate your patience with me this evening. Thank you. Any other words or recognitions? Do you have any comments tonight, Mr. Neisel? I do not. All right. 
have the approval of minutes for our regular meeting on July 17th, 2018. I'll move. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Williams. Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2018-31. Ordinance rezoning real estate, ordinance rezoning tracts of land containing 1.64 acres from RE residential estate to P and PUD planned unit development to HB highway business located on a portion of zero Frist Boulevard and 570 Lovers Lane presently owned by Green Hills Development Partners LLC. I move. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Williams. It's second reading of a unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning. Is there any further discussion? Please call the roll. Williams. Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2018-32. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning a tract of land containing 48.69 acres from RS1D, single family residential, to PUD, planned unit development, located at Zero Plano Road, presently owned by Magnolia Hills, LLC. So moved. Second. Motion by Williams, second by Nash. Second reading of another unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning. Is there any further discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2018-33. Ordinance closing a public right-of-way. Ordinance approving the closing of a portion of right-of-way located between 1169 and 1175 Clay Street. So moved. Second. Perrigan, second by Nash. This is also a second reading of, from a unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning to close right-of-way. Uh, the property owner owns both sides of the street and all of our emergency agencies have already acknowledged that. Is there any further comments or discussion? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-140. Municipal Order approving the promotion of David M. Hayner to the position of Facilities Coordinator in the Public Works Department. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Williams. Mr. Michael. You'll recall the the uh, facilities coordinator position was approved in in this year's budget uh, we we've had a need for some time now to centralize our, our facilities maintenance function here at the city and uh, we have gone out and, and uh, looked at that and come up with a reorganization plan that was presented back at your uh, BOC retreat back in September and I'd like to ask Greg to, to bring his recommendation forward tonight to you for the filling of this position. Thank you, Mr. Mazel, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, David Hayner came to the city of Bowling Green in 2002 to attend Western Kentucky University after transferring from a college in Florida. He earned a degree in industrial science with a focus in architecture in 2006 from Western. While attending school, he worked for Sweets Design Build here in town and ultimately became one of their project field supervisors. Uh, and Dave, if you would stand, Dave's in the back with, uh, with his family. In 2007, Dave began working with the city of Bowling Green in the capacity of public works technician. Since that time, he's managed various building and infrastructure projects, such as sidewalk and storm drainage construction projects. Some of those include facility uh, renovations, uh, which include City Hall, City Hall Annex, Parks and Recs, Moxley Center, Police Headquarters, Sloan Convention Center, Riverview at Hobson Grove, and I could go on and on. Dave's done a lot in terms of renovation. Not only that, he's worked on new building construction projects as construction project manager. Some of those include Parks and Recreation, Coomer Little Building, the Fire Headquarters Administration Building, and Parks and Recs Cemetery Maintenance Building. Dave's communication and organizational skills have allowed him to be successful with past projects and will serve him well as he takes on this new position. With a recent retirement in our facilities management division, Dave will have the flexibility to re-examine previous workflows and project management strategies and will chart a course toward managing additional facilities for the city as we go forward thus prompting more effectiveness and, efficient, uh, and efficiency in those functions. Dave is here today joined by his wife, Casey. They have two children, Catherine, who's three, and Everett, who's two. I have great confidence in the ability and dedication of Mr. Hayner. It's my recommendation that he be appointed 
as facilities coordinator in the Public Works Department. Congratulations, Dave. Excited for you. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Thank you so much. We appreciate the work you've done and what you're going to do. Municipal Order 2018-141. Municipal Order approving the promotion of Adam B. Anderson to the position of Heavy Equipment Operator in the Parks and Recreation Department. So moved. Motion by Nash, second by Williams. Mr. Meisel. I remember uh, back in June, we promoted, promoted Lee Alvey uh, to Cemetery Division Crew Supervisor, which opened up this slot for the Heavy Equipment Operator. Uh, we advertised this internally. We thought we had enough qualified employees uh, within the city. Uh, we posted, there were five applications, three candidates were interviewed by Brent Belcher, Kathy Maroney, Lee Alvey, and Mike Mitchum, along with Tiger Tooley and HR. Uh, they even made him go out, looks like, and dig a hypothetical grave with a, with a backhoe. And Mr. Adam Anderson was the, uh, was the recommended selection for this position. Uh, Adam began working for the cemetery division back in 2010 as a seasonal laborer. Then he was appointed to full-time parks facility man maintainer in 2011. Uh, he's well-trained, versed in, uh, in operating heavy equipment. And Adam's here tonight and recommend his uh, approval for appointment. Ronnie, congratulations, Adam. Happy for you. <laughs> Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-142. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointment of Darren L. Bowen to the position of Code Enforcement Inspector in the Neighborhood and Community Services Department. So moved. Nash second by Perridge and Mr. Meisel. We uh, recently celebrated the retirement of David Herman, a uh, longtime code enforcement officer. Uh, that created, of course, a vacancy. We actually had two vacancies with uh, the transfer of Tim Butts over to building. And so 27 people uh, applied for this, these two positions. 12 were deemed to meet minimum qualifications and uh, NCS interviewed nine candidates. Uh, Brent Childers, James Knapper, and Tiger Tooley were on the interview committee. And after uh, consideration, they have selected an officer, police officer. They, one of the f spots was filled by a police officer, Jared Poteet, which we, we uh, hired recently. But this position tonight, we are recommending Darren Bowen uh, for the position that was vacated by Herman. Uh, Darren is presently a teacher, junior ROTC instructor, uh, retired career counselor, recruiter for the U.S. Army, and has a bachelor's uh, in general studies. And I think Darren is here tonight with us. If you just please stand. Congratulations. Look forward to your work. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-143. Municipal Order approving the probationary appointments of Travis W. Adams, Susanna Aguilar, Wade Matthew Hughes, Miranda N. Roan, Cody R. Tomes, Kendra C. Woodard, and Joshua A. Yobstol to the position of police officer in the police department. Second. By Nash, second by Williams, Mr. Meisel. I'd like to ask uh, Mike Grubbs, our Human Resources Director, to, to come up and introduce our new police officers. Thank you, Mr. Meisel. As the Commission's aware, uh, we go through a hiring process twice a year uh, for a police officer. We started this process back in February uh, with an extensive recruitment process. Uh, offered the law enforcement suitability uh, test three times in order to try to uh, accommodate schedules. Then the candidates have to go through the uh, POPs fitness test that's required by the state. Uh, we had 50 actually show up for that test with 45 passing. 
we started with 120 applicants, so that shows you how many dropped out uh, between the time of the application and actually showing for the fitness test. Uh, probably part of that's because they have to complete a very extensive application, including a polygraph uh, background uh, questionnaire, and some people may choose not to apply once they see all the type of information they have to provide and the type of character that the police department's looking for. From that point, uh, police selected 16 candidates to move on to the polygraph and the psychological evaluation, and then we interviewed 10 candidates, uh, representatives from our citizen workforce and outreach uh, recruitment committee sat in on the interviews that were conducted by the police department along with uh, Tiger Tooley from HR uh, sitting in on the interviews. Uh, we have seven candidates uh, that successfully completed that process. Um, almost all of them have some tie to the police department. We have uh, three uh, former, either four current cadets. We've got a former, four current cadets, one former cadet, a former uh, explorer, and then one outsider uh, who uh, also comes well qualified, and that's Travis Adams who uh, teaches in Allen County. Uh, then we've got the other candidates on the list, uh, uh, Susanna Aguilar, Matt Hughes, uh, Miranda Roan, and Kendra Woodard, Woodard are also are all uh, cadets. Uh, Cody Tomes uh, was a former explorer, and then Josh Yobstel uh, is a former cadet. So uh, they're all here uh, this afternoon and very eager to uh, get to work at the academy. Y'all want to stand up? Group of people, thank you so much. Just remember, 23 weeks at Eastern, you can do it. <laughs> Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilferson? Yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Yeah. I think that's all the hires that are here. If y'all want to slip out, you're welcome to, because I know you have a lot of family things to take care of. Next is Municipal Order 2018-144. Municipal order approving the appointment of Aaron L. Halsey to the position of Human Resources Director in Human Resources and Risk Management Department. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Mr. Muzzle. As you know, uh, our HR Director Mike Grubbs is leaving us at the end of August. Uh, August 31st will be his last day. And Mike was gracious enough to give us plenty of warning and so we are bringing this to you tonight, uh, an appointment for his replacement. Her name is Erin Holsey. Erin uh, comes from a, a corporate background. She has a lot of experience, but uh, just to back up, we, we actually had 56 applications for this position, and Mike uh, reviewed those applications, and we, we got that down to 32 that were qualified. Um, I asked Katie, Jean and uh, Brent Childers to, to help me with the interviewing process and the selection process. We decided to have, or maybe I decided to conduct nine interviews. We had so many good candidates. It was a very tough, uh, competitive uh, process. But of those nine, we feel that Erin Holsey is um, the most experienced. She has 13 years of experience as a human resources director, manager. Uh, master's degree in professional studies in human resources and employment relations. She's also certified as a senior professional of human resources by the HR Certification Institute. And Erin just brings a lot of broad experience in the HR field, things like recruitment, training, organizational development, employment law, employee relations, benefits and compensation. Uh, she even developed a wellness culture program uh, with the help of her insurance broker. She comes from a self-funded insurance plan similar to ours. Uh, she's developed performance management evaluations such as 360 evaluations, uh, experience with payroll, and also developed an electronic onboarding system for new hires to make it more consistent uh, for their new hire experience. So. Um, Fortunately, Aaron is ready to start, and we'll, we'll have some time with Mike starting August 22nd. Um, she is trying to get her family moved down from the Indianapolis area, 
And so luckily though, she'll be able to spend eight or nine days alongside shadowing Mike for a, a transition in that position, Mike, uh, you know, show, showing her the position and, and the way around everything. So uh, we're excited to have Aaron on her way, but we're also sad to see Mike leaving. Uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, in case I don't get a chance next meeting, Mike has, has been uh, just a super um, confidant, yeah. friend, uh, advisor over the years. Uh, Mike really should, he deserves credit for building the HR department, I believe, since he came here in 1986 and was key in probably building our organizational structure with our departments over all these 32 years with the city, along with the city manager. So uh, we're gonna miss Mike, but um, we are bringing Aaron Holsey to you tonight, recommending her appointment for the next human resources director. Questions? Look forward to working with her. You'll be here at the next meeting, right, Mike? I, com I commend y'all for the the effort that you put into this and selecting the right candidate. Mike, we're going to miss you a lot. But uh, thanks for being a part of helping bring somebody on that can at least ease that pain for us for a little bit. Uh, sounds like you picked a good quality person. Mike was a lot of help with, with this process. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. On the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-145. Municipal Order approving the reappointment of Jim Bohannon III to the Bowling Green Warren County Regional Airport Board. I'll move. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Uh, Mr. Bohannon has served uh, on the airport board uh, since uh, 2011. Uh, he's currently serving as chair uh, and is excited since his retirement to be able to spend more time with the airport board. So look forward to his reappointment. Any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Nash. Municipal Order 2018-146. Municipal Order accepting donations from Kentucky Beverage Association and American Beverage Fund. American Beverage Foundation for a Healthy America related to the outdoor fitness equipment project at Preston Miller Park. Second. Motion by Perry, uh, Nash, second by Perigen. Mr. Meisel. I would like to ask uh, Brent Belcher to, to step up and thank these organizations along with Clark Distributing for working with Brent. Uh, Brent, if you'll explain what we got going on here. Mayor Commissioner, Board Commissioners, uh, Mr. Meisel, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Uh, this is a, uh, we're just excited to be in front of you to receive two large checks. Uh, the large in terms of size of the actual checks themselves, the amount of the checks, but also in the, uh, the impact it would have on our community. Uh, these checks are both for $27,500, so a grand total of $55,000 uh, that will contribute towards this project. Uh, one of the checks is from the Kentucky Beverage Association. Uh, that includes uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, RC and Dr. Pepper. So in other words, it's the, uh, it's the guiding force of, of all those into one association. Uh, the other is from the American Beverage uh, Foundation for a Healthy Living. These two donations will assist uh, BGPR, Bowling Green Parks and Rec, with the uh, FY19 development of an outdoor fitness uh, area at Preston Miller Park. Uh, if you're not aware of, Preston Miller Park has a lot of things going on. There's pretty much not a, uh, an acre of construction not going on there, and this will find that one acre that's not, and we're gonna do something else there. Uh, these two grants are designed to help support communities and, proje and projects that will encourage and assist a healthy community lifestyle. Uh, this pending project will do just that and be just another great addition to our department and our community. I do wanna recognize uh, some individuals. These donations are a result of many people uh, that I'd like to recognize tonight. Uh, Dallas Clark, which is the Chief Financial Officer of Clark Beverage Group, Jimmy Briggs, he's the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Clark Beverage Group. George Clark is Vice President of Clark Beverage Group. He's, he's here today. Uh, these gentlemen have been supportive, and supportive of and shared our vision since our preliminary discussions about this project. Uh, the reality is that from our initial meeting, I believe we all knew that we were on to something great and had the opportunity to, uh, to not only uh, win in terms of, of receiving this grant, but also have a great partnership towards that. Uh, 
Les Hugate, also the executive director of the Kentucky Beverage Association, is here. After our preliminary discussions with, uh, with uh, those individuals from Clark Beverage Group, Les kind of took the lead in guiding us how to best present. Uh, I'd also believe his lobbying efforts were, were none short uh, in the process as well. Uh, I can't, uh, lastly, I need to recognize Nick Cook. He's the grants manager for, uh, for the city of Bowling Green. Nick's been the guide and helped us develop this on the city's behalf. Uh, he's been involved from the, from the onset, and uh, uh, his time and talents are one of the major re reasons why we're here today. Uh, with those individuals thanked, I believe we just, we, ha we do have a quick ceremony we'd like to do. We have some, uh, some checks to memorize this partnership, and I end by saying that BGPR looks forward to having everyone out in 2019 when the construction, implementation, and public introduction of this open air fitness zone is completed. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mr. Fugate or Mr. Clark, do you have some comments for us? This is not a prop. I'm actually drinking this. Okay. <laughs> I'm completely neutral. He, he really appreciates you having a Diet Coke. Um, no, we're just really excited to partner with you guys. Um, as you heard, our, our goal is to encourage healthy living. And the, the amount of work that you have done, particularly in your parks and recreation area, is amazing. Uh, and we're excited to be able to continue that and particularly extend it not, just be, not only for children, but to adults as well. And that'll be the focus of the, uh, the equipment that will be installed. And so we're, we're really excited to partner with you and look forward to uh, cutting the ribbon uh, sometime next year. Great. You going to take a picture? That's all down there? Come on, guys. Should I bring my diet coat? I'll be on the very end. We'll be the book end. You guys be in the middle. Of the I'll go on this side. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hold the checks up a little high. There you go. Thank you so much. Oh, we appreciate, appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh, We haven't taken a picture like that in years. <laughs> I wear an eye patch. <laughs> it's picture time. <laughs> At least you got on a tie. <laughs> That's true. You did have a tie on. <laughs> All right. I don't think we voted on that yet, did we? No, we have Please not. Please call the roll. <laughs> Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Periton? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Thank you again, gentlemen. You. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Municipal Order 2018-147. Municipal order authorizing renewal of bid number 2016-55 for structural firefighting turnout gear for the fire department from 911 Fleet and Fire Equipment of Florence, Kentucky, in the amount of $106,060.50. So moved. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Williams. Mr. Meisel. In 2016, we did a contract with 911 Fleet and Equipment, uh, <coughs> enabling the fire department to purchase the turnout gear. Uh, we did uh, a one-year agreement with an option to renew for two additional years, negotiated prices not to exceed a 5% increase for each of those two years, and I believe this is the second of the renewal years that we are approving tonight, bringing that cost per unit uh, with the 5% increase to 27.1950, and I think they're going to buy 39 sets of these. So totaling the 10, uh, what was the number? 106060 number. So Deputy Chief Gillum is here tonight if you have any questions. Comments or questions? Something to relate to this? As you know, um, as you know that uh, the uh, turnout gear is one of the most important um, firefighting uh, tools that the fire department can utilize. And so uh, I'm just coming to you today to 
ask that you approve this um, purchase and funding is available through the fire improvement fund but the, the price doesn't change we get to extend that contract so thank you for looking ahead on that thank you any comments or questions please call the roll williams yes nash yes perigen yes wilferson yes municipal order 2018-148 municipal order authorizing and accepting the purchase of e-draulic rescue tools from thinley fire of lagrange kentucky in the amount not to exceed thirty six thousand dollars for the fire department so moved second motion by nash second by williams mr uh mr Meisel, sorry this is uh what most people know as the jaws of life equipment uh for extrication uh fire department is uh going from a gasoline powered piece of equipment to a, a, a battery powered similar to your lithium battery drill drill and uh, leaf blowers you might see now at home but probably a lot more powerful uh, but I'll let uh, Chief Gillum explain but we're gonna go uh, I think buy four pieces of these at nine thousand dollars a piece for a total of thirty six thousand this is again coming out of your fire improvement fund but deputy chief you got anything else Oh, that's correct uh, as mr. Meisel had stated uh, these are referred to as our, the jaws of life typically in the past uh, what we've utilized is a gasoline powered um, power unit uh, with a, a hydraulic hose and the tool that goes along it's actually pretty cumbersome very very powerful but the uh, new and improved um, state-of-the-art equipment that uh, available to the fire service is now uh, lithium battery operated just as powerful but can be carried by one person and so we can achieve uh, a lot quicker results uh, you know getting to and from the scene without having to pack a bunch of equipment so it's a it's a, a almost a no-brainer to uh, support this this uh, endeavor and we are looking to uh, replace uh, three apparatuses worth of equipment as well as staff a new apparatus with brand new equipment as well so four four purchases in total for thirty six thousand say again I presume they're stationed all around the city that, that's correct. Uh, we'll be replacing the one at uh, the airport station, uh, one of the trucks at West Side, and then one of the trucks downtown uh, with the addition of the fourth one to more than likely go out to the Greenwood Fire Station. Comments or questions? Call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Thank you so much. Municipal Order 2018-149. Municipal order authorizing and accepting <coughs> bid number 2018-60 for NetApp hardware, software, and services from JBK, JBK Network Consulting Limited of Bowling Green, Kentucky, in the amount of $304,370. Second. Motion by Nash, second by <coughs> Williams, Mr. Meisel. I'm going to make an attempt to talk like an IT guy here just for a few seconds, but I've got Lynn Hartley here to back me up. This is a purchase for replacement of our storage area network, also known as our SAN, which uh, supports all of our data storage, like our, what do they call us, data storage farm, both over in the annex and our backup system out at Greenwood Fire Station. Uh, Lynn and IT went out for bid, and they only got, they got two bids, one from JBK, one from I think it's process information systems and JBK was the lowest bid that met all of the qualifications at the 304 370 uh, this is equipment uh, needing replacement uh, this new equipment will also uh, give us more storage capacity and take advantage of newer technology and even increase the uh, throughput for applications that are on these servers so Lynn do you have anything to add I can't see you, but I know you're here. Won't be out of date for at least three or four months, will it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That was, five years yeah. Now, it? yeah, it's state of the art for five <laughs> more minutes. These have gotten us six years, so we're hoping. <laughs> Didn't really address us in the memo, but it. There is a little bit of security built in also with the redundancy Greenwood. Uh, one thing I'm very aware of these days, obviously if you, you read the news is ransomware and things, what happened to the city of Atlanta, uh, we can't have enough backup, you know, cause if it can happen there, it can certainly happen to us and we don't want to be in the news. So the more backup and redundancy we can have, that's also part of the picture. So. 
Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-150. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting the purchase of a forensic 3D laser scanner for the police department from Faro Technologies of Lake Mary, Florida, in the amount of $59,502.72. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Mr. Mosel. This is... Um, this piece of equipment is used going to be used for advanced crime scene and accident reconstruction. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to let Major Casey oh, come up and, and talk about this. <laughs> I think I could explain it, but he can do it a lot better. So, and he made the trip. So he intended not to say anything tonight, but we I was hoping. Good evening, yeah. Major uh, <laughs> Mayor Commission. Uh, thank you for hearing us tonight. Basically, what we're talking about tonight is a forensic scanner that will revolutionize the way we do both reconstruction and crime scene. Uh, as you may or may not know, we are required to reconstruct any crime scene with a fatality inside the city of Bowling Green. And to give you a kind of time, spra time frame that will, this will save, there was an officer-involved shooting in Albuquerque, New Mexico that was over a several block area, and it took the agencies in that area about three weeks to, to shoot that entire scene with lasers uh, for later reconstruction for prosecution. Um, they had a mistake in some of their data. They brought in Faro, and Faro was able to do it in three days. Uh, this device uh, will, uh, will bring it into any crime scene. It is actually an uh, engineering device that is capable of capturing every nuance and measurement in a room uh, within seconds. When you uh, talk about a scanner, it's not the 3D scanner that builds something. It's, it's scanning sir, the area correct. to... To give you those measurements. Correct. Okay. If you're familiar with the total station, the engineering yeah, sure. device that they use, mm -hmm. uh, this that that device shoots one laser at a time. Uh, this one shoots thousands at every second, uh, and is is capable of recreating this entire room with all of us in it in uh, probably about a matter of 20 minutes. Uh, and you would actually be able to immediately download that to a computer and measure the distance between your nose and mine. And it would be actually more accurate than a than a total station does. Appreciate the explanation. Any comments or questions? No. Thank you so much. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-151. Municipal Order authorizing and approving a contract extension for demolition and sinkhole repair services related to bid number 2017-07 from Scott and Ritter Incorporated of Bowling Green, Kentucky in the total amount not to exceed $130,000. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Williams. Mr. Mosel. Each year we have a need for uh, cleanup and demolition of various uh, properties around the city. We also have a need for remediation with sinkholes that, that occur. And so this contract we have with Scott and Ritter is renewable. They they have requested, uh, or sent us a letter to request that we just renew with them for an additional year, and they've uh, kept the price the same. We have a contract with them to not to exceed thirty thousand dollars on any uh, demolition and not to exceed a hundred thousand dollars on any sinkhole remediation. So we're bringing this to you for. Uh, another year renewal with Scott and Ritter at, at the same same prices. Comments or questions? It's Scott and Ritter keeping the prices the same for another year. Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-152. Municipal Order authorizing and accepting bid number 2018-59 for development of stormwater fee in lieu of construction program from Land Design and Development Incorporated of Louisville, Kentucky, the amount of $59,616. So moved. Second. Motion by Williams, second by Perigen. Mr. Mazel. I'd like to ask Matt Powell to come up and give you an overview of this municipal order, what we're proposing. Uh, we did have three bids on this and um, recommending <coughs> the 59,000 to land design and development, but I'll let Matt explain further details. Absolutely, good to see you all again tonight. Uh, what we're doing with this project is establishing an additional alternative for developers here in the community of Bowling Green. 
Our current standards require anyone that has a construction project that exceeds one acre in disturbance and adds an additional 10,000 square foot of impervious surfaces to our stormwater runoff. Uh, the, the ordinance requires that they construct some mechanism by which that stormwater is treated from now into perpetuity. Um, obviously, that's a huge impact for someone who has an extraordinarily high real estate value. Scottsville Road or, or very, very highly developed areas, downtown, things like that. That may be 15 to 20 percent of a lot that's going to have to be dedicated to stormwater is worth much more to them than, say, someone that's developing in green space out on the edge of town. So in order to kind of equalize that burden, uh, the FELOC program or fee in lieu of construction program allows for those developers to pay into a pool of money. Uh, eventually the city will have enough money in that pool for us to build a regional stormwater uh, treatment facility. So you'll kind of hear me back in here from time to time once this process gets rolling uh, so that we can build that regional stormwater treatment facility and thus we'll take care of that from then on. We get some economies of scale behind that. Our dollar goes a little farther in terms of how much water can we treat for each dollar that we spend. Uh, and actuality at the end of this whole process we do a little bit better job of taking care of the Barren River and our other water resources than we would with these individual treatment devices that are on each individual lot that we then have to go chase everybody to help them maintain. Now that process obviously involves us taking in some additional monies. Uh, we're gonna have to get the finance department involved. It involves uh, several uh, ordinances, or not ordinances, but regulatory statutes and administrative regulations that are unfamiliar to me and most everybody else here at the city. Uh, and it also involves a, you know, establishment of the fee, exactly how much is this going to cost. You know, we, you want a balance between this doesn't need to be the default, but yet it doesn't also need to be unattainable. So what LD&D will do is come in and help us to find that balance in all of these different areas so that when we write a plan, it's what the developers are looking for. And in fact, step one is a advisory committee of local developers to come in with us and say, what do you want from this? How can we make sure that this helps you all? So ultimately what we're trying to do here is without uh, losing any of the battle that we're fighting to try to keep our local waterways clean, that we also provide an additional pathway for compliance for development. Great exclamation comments or questions? A sure. question. Uh, what is, and you may not know, but what is the cost currently? Because I would assume that the, the developer is maintaining the cost of the uh, of the stormwater area now mm -hmm. and we're now going to take on that responsibility the taxpayers are Wh what's the difference in cost between the two highly variable uh, from development to development um, there are roughly nine versions of the technology that they can install that could achieve compliance now uh, for instance something like a hydrodynamic separator which everybody's tends to be, if you're familiar with stormwater all, you're familiar with these. Those are the concrete boxes that have the baffle walls and things inside of them. Um, those are reasonably labor intensive. They can be up to, uh, depending on the construction project, up to three tenths of a percent of the project cost to get everything installed, and then roughly 10% beyond that per annum for maintenance needs. So for instance, a, a $10,000 box may cost about $3,000 a year to keep it maintained. Um, in terms of what we're going to do with the taxpayer taking over that responsibility, that's part of that fee structure. Um, so it wouldn't be as simple as going to the development community and saying, okay, if it were going to cost you, and I'm keeping the numbers loose for, for the sake of our conversation, uh, it wouldn't be as simple as going and saying, hey, that box was going to have cost you $10,000. If you give us the $10,000, then you don't have to do it anymore because that would be losing sight of that 10, 20, 30 years of maintenance cost on down the road. So that's part of that development of that fee. I don't know <coughs> precisely what that would look like. Most communities who've done it, and we'd be the third or fourth one in the state of Kentucky to do it, do it based around what they call the ERU, which is the equivalent residential unit. Um, and so they took a look at citywide exactly how much impervious surface does each person have and then what are our costs uh, as a community for dealing with those and, and based on a single residence being an ERU, uh, commercial enterprise would then pay so many ERUs per, you know, what there it is they're trying to accomplish. So we would hope that the taxpayers see a benefit from the fact that we can achieve that economy of scale, get more treatment for less dollars, and further, we hope that they're not harmed at all, uh, that we don't lose sight of that maintenance cost that we're taking over from the private side. Good answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2018-153. Municipal Order approving a job development incentive program employee withholdings credit agreement with Bendix Spicer Foundation Break, Break LLC. I'll move. Urgent second by Nash. Mr. Mazel. A couple of weeks ago, our job development 
incentive committee met with uh, Commissioner Parridge and Commissioner Nash. This project was brought to us by the chamber. It's an expansion of Bendix Spicer, uh, current industry here in Bowling Green. Uh, they're going to add 143 new jobs. It's uh, about a $6 million capital uh, investment. We agreed to do the 1% like we usually do as a uh, match to the state's 3% credit on their withholdings. And that will go for 10 years. I think I mentioned that. But the city's 1% uh, is worth, or the, or the company's 1% is actually worth 679000 over the 10 year period. And the city's share would be. $577,000 roughly over those 10 years for these 143 jobs. Uh, all this uh, has to wait for activation by the state once it, they reach their numbers. Until they reach the 143, there's no incentives that take place. So um, we recommend your approval of this incentive. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2018-34. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning a tract of land containing 18.8426 acres from AG Agriculture to RS1D, single family residential, located at Iris Hill Street and Sagittarius Avenue, presently owned by Greg Reese and Dennis and Lori Causey. Second. Motion by Nash, second. Williams, a uh, unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning for the re for the rezoning. Are there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of Ordinance BG 2018-35. Ordinance closing a public right-of-way. Ordinance approving the closing of a portion of Chestnut Street right-of-way located between 30 U.S. 31W Bypass and Barron River. So move. Second. Motion by Perigen. Second by Williams. This is a first reading of a unanimous recommendation. Again, this is in the middle of one of uh, uh, the medical community's parking lots, really. Uh, can we give them First Street, too? Can we give them First Street as well? <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> See what you can do on that one. <laughs> I thought it was BG&E. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. It is BG&E. BG &E. Yes, I apologize. Right yeah, that's why it's here, so I apologize. Any comments or questions? Yeah. I think the medical center, we can get first street to them. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Williams? Yes. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Last item we have on the agenda, uh, our public comment section, we usually have people sign up. Are there any other uh, people need to sign up? I think someone signed up coming in the door. So it'll just be Ms. Christmas, is that correct? Or just one? Just one on the sheet? Okay, Ms. Christmas, go ahead. It's been almost a year since I was asked to set up a booth at the first Pride Fest that ever took place in Bowling Green. I was asked to do that because I have a business on Main Street that seeks to serve the community. I strive to be an art resource and to provide a community space. I teach art to children. When I chose to put the word community on my sign out front, I could not completely visualize what that meant, but I soon learned that it meant to be inclusive. Being inclusive is not always easy. It is not possible to love everyone. But it is, I believe, a worthy endeavor to open one's heart and one's mind. If we do that, we are always learning. The way to learn to love is to listen. So I was asked to have a booth at the first Pride Fest, and I planned an art activity. Lots of kids sat down for a period of time, long enough to make some art. What I saw that day when it opened my mind and my heart was that lots of the children who sat down were painfully shy. They were at an awkward stage of adolescence, and many of them were even younger. It seemed to me that they were at that stage where they were seeking identity and self-esteem, as most youngsters are. I listened to things they said, sometimes to me and sometimes to each other. As I listened, it was difficult for me to ignore the protesters who were shouting behind me on their bullhorn. They were yelling derogatory insults to folks in the crowd. And from my perspective, since I was looking into the faces of children and they were behind me, they seemed to be yelling at the children. 
and I could see that the children appeared to ignore the hurtful words more easily than I could. It made me wince to hear children being called fornicators and to hear children being told that they were going to hell that day by men shouting through a very loud bullhorn. Most young people are simply asking themselves, as we all do during our early development, who am I? Where do I belong? Who will I ever find who feels like I do? Who will be my friends? What young children need most of all is to develop their sense of self-esteem. If they can learn to feel good about themselves, all the rest will follow. I discovered that day that my presence at the Pride Fest meant something to some children I already knew who were my students, who were children I had known a long time. They felt more comfortable after that to talk to me, to share with me works of art and writing they had done that I do not think they would have shared with me otherwise. As I looked around that day, I saw people carrying heavy furniture and equipment, setting up tents and displays, organizing booths and activities, folks from all walks of life, sisters and brothers, neighbors and parents showing acceptance and love. I think that most of the people who have attended these fairness sessions in City Hall for the past two and a half years are here for the same reason as the more than 1,000 people who attended the BG Pride Fest last year. They are doing it out of concern, acceptance, and love. I'm not an educator who's trying to influence children in any particular way. I'm only an older person who has not stopped learning. I'm only an older person who seeks to open my heart and listen to young people. I'm someone who has learned that what children mostly need from me is not words, but simply my acceptance. Likewise, there's no reason to think that whether or not this city passes an ordinance, it will influence anyone's identity one way or another. It simply will be an example of showing acceptance and being inclusive of all people. This is necessary in order to call ourselves a community. What I most hope that might come from my standing before this group of city commissioners and concerned citizens is that you will remember that it is not your job to only represent some of the citizens in this community, but to open your minds and your hearts to all of them, to realize that you're not voting to determine whether or not you like a particular group of people. It is not whether or not you like or accept someone's religion, their race, their culture, their income or educational level, their gender, or what pronoun they choose to call themselves, it is only your job as an elected official to determine whether or not any members of these groups is entitled to be hired I'm or sorry. to have a place to live. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, that's the end of our meeting. Uh, our next scheduled meeting is August 20, Tuesday, August 21st, 2018. Thank you for tuning in.